Friends, Shabbat Shalom, I welcome all of you to our service this evening. For those who are watching on uh, whatever we call this, what do we call this? The Zooming? Online. Online, okay. Those of you who are participating live stream, we welcome you. And what I'm finding interesting is, is that people who are live streaming in, and you're gonna, the people live streaming have to tell us what, what's happening. Um, it's not just locally. We have people everywhere watching us. Um, and I find that to be amazing. I don't even know how people find out about us. How do you find out about us? <laughs> it, it, and if, you, if you're on Facebook, tell us how you found out about us. Now we won't read the comments now, but we'll read them later. So just tell us who you are, how'd you get here. Um, we're very happy to have you, um, but unless you communicate to us, we don't know. I've never spoken to the camera like that before. Uh, so we are going to um, continue in our service. We're gonna begin our service on page two with Lachad Dodi.
atirat bara gam bishimkha We are going to turn to page seven as we, kindle, as we continue with the kindling of the Shabbat lights. And we call upon Donna Holmes to come forward to uh, light the Shabbat lights for us. No, you read this thing first. Okay. Come, let us welcome Shabbat. May its radiance warm our hearts as we kindle these tapers. Light is a symbol of God's presence in our lives. The eternal one is our light and our salvation. Light is a symbol of the holiness within each of us. The human spirit is the light of God. Light is a symbol of the Torah's teachings. The commandment is a lamp and the Torah is a light. Light is a symbol of Israel's mission as it is written. I have made you a covenant people to serve as a light to the nations. Therefore, in the spirit of our ancient tradition, that Hallows unites Israel in all lands and all ages, we kindle the lights of Shabbat. Aruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Avalon. Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvotah B'tzivanu L'hav L'kner Shel Shabbat We praise our eternal God, creator of the universe, who hallows our lives through laws and ethical teachings. We are mindful of these timeless values as we kindle the lights of Shabbat. May God bless us with Shabbat joy. May God bless us with Shabbat holiness. May God bless us with Shabbat peace. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. We are going to continue in our worship on page 78 as we rise for the Barucho. We join together on the top of page 80. 
Infinite as is your power, even so is your love. It may be seen through the history of our people Israel, through the laws and ethical precepts, through statutes and ordinances. You have led us in the ways of righteousness and brought us to the light of truth. Therefore, at our lying down and our rising up, we will meditate on the Torah's teachings, finding within it the inspiration and guidance for our daily lives. May your love never depart from our hearts. We praise you, God. You have revealed us. I'm just making up the translation as I go along. <laughs> it has no connection to anything. You know, I'm inspired by your, your, your creativity. So I'm just making it up and hopefully... It's improvisation. It's it's improvisation of the prayers. Let us continue with Ahavat Olam. Ahavat Olam Beit Yisrael Page 81, let us continue with the Shema. Amen. 
On page 84, let us read these verses responsively. Trust in the Eternal One with all your heart, and do not rely only on your own limited understanding. Remember God's commandments and do them, that you should not follow only your own heart and your own eyes. Time and again, God has redeemed us from the hands of oppressors and revived our spirits when all strength failed us. God's works and wonders surpass our understanding. God's gifts and blessings are without number. We rejoice in God's guiding power. We praise and give thanks to the Eternal One. We continue with Micha Mocha. Five, we are going to join together in the chanting of the Shamru. The Shamru Let us join together on the top of page 86. Grant, O God, that we may lie down in peace and rise up again to life, 
Spread over us the shelter of your peace. Guide us with wise counsel. Be as a shield about us, fortifying us against hatred and war, against pestilence and sorrow. Curb within us the inclination to do evil and comfort us with the embrace of your love. Guide our going out and coming in to life and peace from this time forth and forever. We praise you, God, for you shelter us and all who dwell on earth. We continue with Hashkivenu. Hashkivenu. turn now to the Amidah, our standing prayer. We ask everyone to please rise and we continue on the top of the page. Let us be seated and let us read these verses responsibly on page 89. For the expanding grandeur of creation, worlds known and unknown, galaxies beyond galaxies, filling us with awe and wonder. For this fragile planet Earth, its times and tides, its sunsets and seasons, for the joy of human life, its wonders and surprises, its hopes and achievements, for human community, our common past and future hopes, our oneness transcending all separation, our capacity to work for peace and justice in the midst of hostility and oppression, for high aspirations and noble causes, for faith without fanaticism, for understanding of views not shared, for all who labor and suffer for our fairer world, who risk their personal well-being so that others might live in dignity and freedom, for human liberties and sacred rights, for opportunities to change and grow, to affirm and choose. We pray for that we may live not by our fears, but by our hopes, not by our words, but by our deeds, 
Blessed are you, Eternal One, to whom all thanks are due. We continue on page 90. May we then be just and great-hearted in our dealings with one another, sharing the fruits of our common labor, acknowledging that we are but stewards of whatever we possess. Help us to be among those who give generously of themselves that others may not hunger, who dare to be bearers of light in the dark loneliness of stricken lives, who struggle and even bleed for the triumph of justice for all people, so shall we be partners in the repair of our world, for that has been our vision and goal throughout the ages. Together, our God and God of all ages, grant that our worship on this Shabbat may be acceptable to you. Sanctify us through your commandments that the serenity of Shabbat may enter our lives. Teach us to be satisfied with the gifts of your goodness and grateful to rejoice in all that you bestow. Purify our hearts that we may serve you in truth. Inspire us to preserve Shabbat as Israel's heritage from generation to generation. May it bring rest and joy, peace and comfort to the dwellings of our people, and that through it you may be revered throughout the world. We praise our God who sanctifies Shabbat. On page 93, Grant us peace, your most precious gift, eternal source of peace, and enable our people Israel to be its messengers to all the world. Bless our country that it may ever be a pursuer of peace and its advocate in the Council of Nations. May contentment reign within our borders, health and happiness within our homes. Strengthen the bonds of friendship and harmony among the inhabitants of all lands. Plant virtue in every soul, and may our love for you hallow every home in every heart. We praise you, O God, giver of peace. And we join together in saying amen. amen. Let's continue with Shalom Rav. Shalom Rav, Yisrael Amcha, Tashim Le'olam. Shalom Rav, Yisrael Amcha, Tashim Le'olam. We continue in some moments of private devotion and reflection.
Friends, let's turn back in our seat to read our prayer books to page 10, and we will continue with some prayers for those who are ill. Prayer invites God's presence to lift our spirits. It allows the blessing and gift of hope to prevail in our lives. Prayer may not bring water to parched fields, nor mend a broken bridge, nor rebuild a ruined city. But prayer can water an arid soul, mend a broken heart, and rebuild a weakened will. Together, we pray for all people who are at this hour are in sickness, in want, or in distress of body or spirit. We name in our hearts those who are near to us, whose pain we feel pain. Let them know your help and feel your presence, realizing that Friends, every week we come to our service and seeking to celebrate Shabbat and seeking a sense of peace and harmony within ourselves. But there is also disharmony. Um, there is a recognition that there is pain and brokenness in our world. There are people who are ill. There are people who are struggling. Um, there are so many hurts in this world, it's hard to even fully comprehend them. So when we recite the Mishaberach, we are praying that this great force that is outside of us, that we're not sure what exactly it is, will become a force that allows us within ourselves to heal and to bring healing to others. So let's continue with Misha Berach in the middle of page 10. Misha Berach Avoteinu Mikor Habracha
I have an announcement to make that I failed to make it failed to make in the beginning, and it's one that I need to um, state every week. So for our own security, obviously we have a new um, building, and uh, as one of the policemen who was there said, "Boy, the place has turned literally around," which it has, and. Everyone who comes need to, needs to know how to get out of here in case we have to leave the sanctuary. So obviously there's an exit here, but also there's an exit over here. And for whatever reason we needed to get out of, out of the, the um, sanctuary and we couldn't go there, you go straight out the doors and then there's big white doors, you go out and you're outside. So one should be aware of that. And just remind me to remind you every week because I want people to know. And uh, it's important that all of us know how the building works. It is remarkable how some people, I mean, who are able to endure such difficulties, and yet at the end of those difficulties or going through the, those experiences, they end up doing extraordinary things. Tonight, I'm not giving a sermon. Um, one of the great reform rabbis of our time who died in Jerusalem this past week is giving the sermon. And it's not going to be anything spooky. Um, I'm going to pull this off by creating a context through some autobiographical biographical information and then share with you an excerpt from his writings. Rabbi Dow Marmer, and it's, the name is D-O-W, I'm not mispronouncing it. Dow Marmer died in Jerusalem on July 17th, and he was 87 years old. On July 18th, a funeral was held in Har Haminuchot in the hills of Jerusalem. He had one of the most extraordinary lives that we will ever learn about. And I'm not being hyperbolic at all. His wandering life took him from the war-torn Poland to Siberia, to Uzbekistan, back to Poland, Sweden, England, Canada, and finally to the land of Israel. Among the six books that he authored was his 2004, Six Lives, his memoir, reviewed as a testament to one Holocaust survivor's indomitable spirit and deep need to serve the Jewish people. Rabbi Marmer survived harsh, life-threatening circumstances during and after the Second World War. This is how he structured his lives and their significance in his memoir. Poland beginnings, Soviet Union exile, Sweden refuge, England vocation, Canada challenge, Israel homecoming. The idea of Canada being a challenge doesn't quite fit, but okay. It's cold. It's, okay, fine. It's cold. He was born in 1935 in the southern Polish city of Sosnowiec. N nearly a quarter of its residents were Jews. He was the only child of Max and, C and Cecilia Marmer, both who were involved in the Polite Sion movement, a kind of very left wing socialist Zionist movement. His father worked as a factory foreman. Even though he had no real Jewish education as a child, he attended a Zionist school where he mastered Hebrew. And at the outbreak of, war, of the war in 1939, his family shifted eastward to the town of Jaslo, Jaslo, then further east to Lvov region in Ukraine. But in 1940, they were deported to Siberia Following the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, they found refuge in Uzbekistan, where they remained until they were re repatriated to Poland in 1946. His family moved to Gothenburg, Sweden in 1948, and there he began studying religion at the University of Stockholm. And in that same year, he married Fredsia Zonenbend, a survivor of the Lodz ghetto. Rabbi Marmer felt unfulfilled at the university in, in, in Sweden, and he, he was on a spiritual quest. There's an essay I just read about him, by him this week where he talks about that. So he and his bride went to London where he entered the Leo Beck College, the liberal seminary, and studied under several luminaries of the reform movement in Great Britain. 
He was ordained in 1962 and was already serving as a spiritual leader of the Southwest Essex Reform Synagogue in Ilford. And in 1969, he became the rabbi of the West, Northwestern Reform Synagogue in Aylith Gardens. And he made that synagogue one of the premier reform synagogues in, in the UK. He was the first British reform rabbi to embrace Jewish day schooling, where he supported his support led to the first progressive Jewish school in the UK called Akiva. And in 1983, he was offered an extraordinary opportunity. Senior rabbi is the renowned Holy Blossom Temple in Toronto, which is already the home of an extraordinary figure in reform movement, Rabbi Gunter Plaut, who had earlier become the congregation's senior scholar. Marmer inspires me. He was, in my view, the rabbi scholar who clearly articulated a kind of what I call a serious reform Judaism that I, I aspire to. The late Irving Abella, in her brief history of this Holy Blossom Temple, which is like an institution in Toronto, wrote that Rabbi Marmer was both a traditionalist and a pragmatist, a teacher and preacher par excellence. And I quote, his major concern was adult education when teaching his congregants the value of reform Judaism. His emphasis would be on the noun Judaism and not the adjective reform. And under Rabbi Marmer, adult learning became a priority. And though he found his early years at the temple challenging, he was widely respected for his erudition, appreciated for his willingness to discuss theology, and admired for his successful efforts in making services more traditional and meaningful. In other words, he was a stubborn guy who had a vision, and he didn't give up on it. In other words, he got pushback when he wanted to bring more tradition to the synagogue. Now, what was he like? So there was a, there was a, um, a funeral in Jerusalem, and it was um, shared throughout the world, and I was able to watch some of it, um, not live, but um, somewhere on Facebook. And this is what people said about him, his, his daughter. His daughter recalled that he was an atypical father, one with no discernible hobbies, who didn't barbecue or tinker in a garage. My dad was a scholar, mentor, and leader. My dad had presence and substance. He was as stern as he was soft. He was as demanding as he was forgiving. My dad wasn't like other dads. He was a workaholic and a homebody. That's what his daughter said about him. In her eulogy, the current rabbi of Holy Blossom Synagogue, Rabbi Yael Splansky, said what he did in his rabbinate was to do what is right. And she gave three examples of it, which I really want us to hear, because they really challenge us. Under his leadership, Holy Blossom established Out of the Cold, a program that welcomed the homeless. Every Thursday evening, the hungry, the homeless, and the lonely were invited guests for a warm meal, warm hospitality, and good night's sleep. At the beginning, some congregants raised concerns and neighbors protested. But Rabbi Marmer and his partners held fast to the mitzvah, and decades later, out of the cold program is a point of pride for the Holy Blossom, Holy Blossom community. In the 1980s and early 90s, when the AIDS epidemic was raging and young men were dying, young Jewish men were dying, most people only spoke in whispers about it. You, you remember that if you were alive. But Rabbi Marmer and a mission-driven team of women at the Holy Blossom got working, and they established support networks for people living and dying of AIDS and for their loved ones. And they raised funds to cover medical bills and funeral costs, and they created a third Seder with its own Haggadah. Most importantly, they turned the whispers of fear and shame into an openness and full, a full-voiced expression of dignity, humanity, and eventually justice and pride. He insisted that the needs of the community must take precedent over the needs of the individual. And he delivered this counterculture message consistently. While the congregation was sometimes reluctant to receive his message, they accepted his stance and admired him for it. And Rabbi Marmer often said they thought they were getting an English gentleman, but what they were getting was a loud Polish Jew. 
Rabbi Elise Goldstein, who I know, was his first assistant, and she speaks about the fact that in 1980s, when this wasn't normal, quote unquote, she, he was a great advocate for her as a woman rabbi in Toronto. He was an ardent Zionist, and I have to give you the list of organizations that he participated in. And in the year 2000, he made Aliyah. And why am I speaking about him? First of all, he inspires me, but I have a little, Jane and I have a little connection with him. Um, my daughter, as you know, is a, rab a rabbinical student. And uh, Rabbi Marmer's son is a professor of Jewish thought at Hebrew College and one of my daughter's mentors, in, in himself a real mensch. And she was at his shiva, so she was giving me a little flavor about him and their family. And he just was an extraordinary man. So that's a little bit of his background. He, he should be remembered. Um, I'm going to reference him in the years to come, his voice. And I, I want to mention him at his yurt site in the coming. I want to put him on our yurt site list because we should think about him. Now, I have to share with you something that he wrote. And um, it's a rabbi with boxing gloves on. This is one of his books on being a Jew, a reform perspective. And uh, it's really good. And the chapter is Assertive Judaism. And let me read to you um, the section called Continuity. And uh, it's got a punch to it, which is good. I like messages that have punches. If a rabbi can't get up and give a good punch, he shouldn't be a rabbi. Do you, do, do, Daniel, you agree with that, don't you? Yeah, I mean, you shook your head. You don't want to hurt somebody, but you got to get, you got to make a point. If you're afraid to make a point, why are you standing up here? Okay, so here it is. Continuity. This is the outlook I would like to teach our children. I referred earlier to the futility of infantilizing Judaism. Now I wish to speak of the nobility of presenting it to future generations as a way for us, the, the adults, as something that we are not just proud of when anti-Semites attack us, letting them decide our identity, but something we feel passionately about when times are good and, alter and alternatives are freely available. Our aim must be to imbue the young with a commitment to Judaism that is not based on ghetto siege mentality. And this man is a Holocaust survivor of, the, of, of a severe extent, but one that presupposes the free and open society for which we all strive and which we all thrive. In other words, we want our Judaism to thrive in a free society, not because we're afraid of anti-Semites. Such freedom must also mean that we do not necessarily exercise all options available to us. If I am truly free, I must be able to set boundaries for myself. And if the society in which I live is truly tolerant, it must not impose conformity and uniformity on me. The assertive Jew will have subjected himself or herself to a discipline by which the values of our religion can be made manifest in the sancta of our tradition made visible. If freedom forces people to obliterate their peculiarities in order to be integrated, it soon becomes a new kind of totalitarianism. Therefore, it is only as observant Jews that we can be assertive, observant reformed Jews, of course. It is in this way, too, that we can act as role models for our children. Only if they see with their own eyes that Judaism matters to their parents will it matter to them. Only if they are witness the significance of Jewish values and Jewish practices for their parents will they recognize the opportunities these values and practices offer their own lives. If the only Judaism that they see is what the teacher teaches in religious school, it will be virtually pointless. I love this guy. Holy moly. I wish I was there when he gave this message if he ever gave it, but think back on what you actually remember of what you were taught in public school at the age of 10. Had we not used reading and writing since those days, it is unlikely we would be literate today. 
And had we not seen our parents read and write, it is unlikely we would have wanted to do the same. Our general education is largely bound up with our parental behavior and attitudes. Why should edu Jewish education be different? Unless our children are encouraged by examples to use the skills acquired in religious school, the entire enterprise will have been futile. No wonder that, according to many surveys, Hebrew school students often know less Hebrew at the higher grades than they know at the lower ones. A sense of futility is a powerful disincentive. If you only experience a Jewish festival in a religious school and not as part of a life of your family, you will soon identify it as boring game and opt out. If Jewish observance is perceived as a kid's game, the aim will be to grow up and be like daddy and mommy as soon as possible, that is, non-observant. Assertive Judaism is also the op opposite of vicarious Judaism. It is my Judaism, not the Judaism of my ancestors or of my Israeli cousins or even of my children. That's five paragraphs of this book. He spoke the truth as he saw it. He built his community by being assertive. He lived his rabbinate by saying things that people didn't like, but they allowed that to happen and embraced it because they respected who he was. This is a great religious leader that the Jewish community has lost, and most of us didn't even know who he was, and we are so enriched because of him. And let's get a, a framework for this. He basically single-handedly uh, um, reaffirmed and reestablished Reform Judaism in the, in the United Kingdom. And he, was, he took this Holy Blossom Synagogue, which was extraordinary, and made it like um, Tesla of Jewish life in Canada. This piece is just a little excerpt from something he said in, in 1989. And it has, as I said, a real punch. You can like it or not like it. You can think it's too strong or unfair or whatever it means. But his voice is something that needs to be heard now and for generations to come. And we pray that his voice rings forth into eternity. Um, we ask God to bless him and to remember him. Amen. So let's continue in our service on page 386. And, and, sorry, it's 368. And as we rise for the adoration. Let us adore the ever-living God. We offer praise unto you who spread out the heavens and established the earth. Your glory is revealed. Seated. Let's join together on the top of page 369. May the time not be distant, O God, when you shall be worshipped throughout the earth, when unbelief shall disappear and error be no more. Fervently we pray that the day may come when all people shall be guided by your teachings. Corruption and evil shall give way to purity and goodness. 
Superstition shall no longer enslave the mind, nor idolatry blind the eye. Then all who dwell in earth shall know that to you alone every knee shall bend and every voice give praise. May all created in your image recognize that we are brothers and sisters, so that one in spirit and one in harmony be forever united before you. Then shall your reign be established on earth, and the word of your ancient prophet be fulfilled. The eternal God will reign forever and ever. On that day the eternal shall be one, and God's name shall be one. At this time, we call the yurt sites that are part of the permanent memory of our community. Patty Renee Bastable, Annette Block, Richard Block, Linda Fox Bortnick, Jerry Freirich, Marjorie Greenberg, Antonia Greenman, Betty Ann Koralchik, Selma Barth Liebman, Joshua David Lucht, Carol Siegel, and John R. Weimer. And during the period of the Shaloshim, the 30 days after the death of a loved one, we recall the passing of Gloria Block and John Sight. In solemn testimony to that unbroken faith that links the generations of the House of Israel one to another, we ask everyone to please rise as we join together with those who are mourners and those observing your sight and reciting the mourners Kaddish. Yit Kadal, Yit Kadash, Shemei Rabbah. Bioma divrach hirute, viam lich machute, Bichayechon uv yemechon uv chayedecho be Yisroel. Bagalav is man kariv yimru amen. Yehe shme rabam mivorach leolam ome omaya. Yit barach, viishtabach, vi paar, vitramam, viet nase, vieta dar, vieta le, vieta lal shme de kudesha berechu. Le lam and ko birchata vishirata, dushbechata venechamata. Dami run be Oma Vimru Amen. Yehe Shlama Rabamin Shemaya, Vechayim Alenu Vyako Yisrael Vimru Amen. O se shalom bimramav, hu ya ase shalom, alenu vyako Yisrael Vimru Amen. May the one who causes peace to reign in the high heavens, let peace descend on us and all Israel and all the world, and let us say Amen. Let us be seated. The Shabbat flowers are dedicated in memory of Patty Rone Bastable by Leland and Jill Shoren, in memory of Joshua David Lucht by David uh, by Ethan and Sam Minor Lucht, in memory of Carol Siegel by Chris and Donna Holmes, and the Oning Shabbat is sponsored this evening by Daniel and Kelly Morell and we thank them for that donation and supporting our own Shabbat. Just some important announcements. Religious school registration is happening, and uh, we encourage you to register children, and also we really encourage um, for all of us, to, all of you, everyone out there, to, be, um, to missionize for our congregation religious school. Um, it's really important that we, for the school to maintain its quality and its critical mass, that we continually replenish our students in the lower grades. And uh, so we need students who are pre-K, K, first grade, second grade. Um, those are the grades that, that we need so that we can have um, classes that are of appropriate size. Not, not to say that if we have children, if we have three kids, we'll do a, we'll do a, a class too. But, for obvious reasons, the more children we have, the better the experience of, of religious school. So I ask everyone to, to missionize for us, so to speak. The community-wide Tisha B'Av observance is, next, is Saturday, August 6th at 9.15 p.m. at Congregation Beth Shalom. You, there's more information out on the screen out there, and it's on our weekly announcements. Um, the community-wide course Judaism for Conversion Candidates begins in August. 
Classes will take place virtually on Thursday evening from 7 to 9 p.m. and some sessions will be held in person and may rotate among the synagogues and Jewish community campus. Everyone's trying to figure out the COVID situation. Um, I figured out the COVID situation. I'm wearing a mask. Um, and an orientation session is scheduled for August 11th. On the day of discovery, a community, a community um, learning day is on August 21st at the JCC. Um, we just had a, a, a social justice committee meeting on um, Tuesday night. Okay, two, I, I can't. I had so many meetings this week. I can't keep track of it. So on um, Tuesday. You were there. I mean, Donna was there. Um, and uh, we have a lot of things that are percolating. Um, we obviously would like people to participate. And if you're interested, we're not asking a lot, but it'd be good to have, again, um, a critical mass of people who are dedicated to social justice uh, to um, participate in the committee in some way. We're not a meeting intensive organization. We're, we're a doing intensive committee. And of course, um, our, our important announcement each week, the Jewish Family Services Health and Snack and Toilet Tissue Drive. And we are called upon to collect toilet tissue, granola, and fruit bars to help people in our community who can't afford healthy food, and we collect it here. And as I've said every week, I'm not sure what the connection is between toilet paper and granola, um, but that's a whole other topic. See, people, don't, people are not getting the joke. Oh, they don't get it. Okay. They, don't, they get it. You think that they're just afraid to, they're afraid to respond to it? Yes. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm talking to you. <laughs> okay. Um, any other announcements? I have to say, this, this is like the greatest crowd in the whole world. Can, can you imagine people coming to services on Friday night when there's a 106 right. degree heat index. I mean, these people are unbelievable. I mean, we're, we're here because we're, we're obligated to be here. <laughs> because They're here because of their love of, of, of Judaism and of the synagogue. Thank you. It's amazing because I think it's hell out there. Um, okay. So we are going to continue with Oseh Shalom. I mean, I, we've done very well tonight. We have not missed a cue. I missed a page, but uh, we're going to continue with Oseh Shalom on page um, 429. <laughs> Say shalom alenu the alko Israel be meru amen o say shalom be roma who ya say shalom Shalom must go out into the foyer for our owning Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom. I want you to see that I am. I think it's reflecting off the top, so it's better if it kind of has your body. Every, every yeah, because we're getting feedback. Yeah, well, that'll help, like angling no, no, that. No, but, but, but the fold should be right. Yeah, should well, be. that should be that. But also, if you're on your earpiece, it'll be a lot better. That makes it harder. I mean, this, this is not, this is not like talk about the earpiece. No, obviously.
is I mean, just the I mean, facts, it's man. How you doing, Dee? 